Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming out. This is uh, How Do I Tales, a beginner's guide to anonymous computing. Um, first off, I'd like to thank the EFF for providing an awesome space and the opportunity to be able to talk and you know, help uh, share this information with you guys. Um, yeah, it is a little strange to have two things going at the same time. So uh, if, if you need me to repeat anything, uh, let me know. Um, also, uh, I'd like for this to, to be kind of a, a dialogue. I'm, I'm definitely not the smartest person in the room. Um, so if you do have questions, things like that, let me know. Uh, just a heads up, I am recording this. So um, I, I, I'll be cutting out the, the audio. So if you do ask a question, I'll only be using the lapel mic. So um, yeah, I won't be using any audio from the camera itself. Uh, just because uh, in, in trying to research this, there's not very many good presentations on Tails itself. So, um, yeah, just a, just a heads up on that. I wanted to, you know, make sure there was full disclosure there. So, uh, if you do have a question, uh, you know, feel free to ask it. I, I will be cutting out any audio aside from my mic. So, um, but, uh, yeah, so first off, who am I? Uh, my name is Forbo. Um, my handle is Forbo. Uh, my name is Forrest. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm currently a penetration tester. Uh, in the past, I was a sysadmin and network administrator. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I am a, a big privacy advocate. Um, I uh, protested the, the NSA's data center out in, in Utah, um, as well as volunteered at the Crypto and Privacy Village last year. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's something that I'm really passionate about and uh, happy to be able to, to spread that information to other people. Um, so basically just what is covered in this talk is uh, what Tails is, uh, who uses it, and why. Uh, basically how it works, how to start up using it. Uh, I'll, I'll actually um, provide you step-by-step -step instructions on getting your own instance up and running. Uh, as well as covering a little bit of threat modeling and operational security. Um, so with that, let's, uh, let's just dive right in. Um, so what is Tails? It's a uh, direct quote from their site, a security-focused Debian-based Linux distribution aimed at preserving privacy and anonymity. So it's, it's a portable live Linux distro. If you've ever used something like Nopix or any other live distribution, um, you, you basically can put it on a flash drive, an SD card, uh, burn it to a DVD, whatever, take it to whatever computer you need, like a library or public ter terminal, uh, and just boot to your own operating system without leaving a, a trace that you ever use that computer. Um, so it routes all traffic through Tor by default. So uh, it makes it more difficult to trace you or track your actions. Um, uh, anything that tries to communicate directly with the internet is is blocked using IP tables. Chair the speaker. So, where did Tails come from? It originally started out as a project called Incognito. Um, that was a Gentoo-based distribution. I believe it was released originally in 2008. Uh, started out in January. I think by August they had closed up shop. Uh, so from there. Uh, in 2009, uh, Tails was first released, uh, had a pretty horrible logo, as you, as you can see there. I, I had no idea what that was even supposed to be. I thought it was like a rabbit head or something. Turns out it's a cat walking through a door. I don't know. So I'm, I'm glad they've definitely uh, changed it up, made it a little bit more user friendly. Um, so. Uh, Tails operates on a six-week release cycle that tries to follow uh, the Firefox extended support release. Uh, so just for coordinating security patches and things like that, anytime they release a new version of Tails, it has the newest version of the Tor browser. So uh, just, just trying to keep pace with any, any security um, uh, patches that have been put out within the last six weeks. Um, so the next release is actually version 1.5. Uh, that's coming out on August 11th. 
So just this, this coming, is that Tuesday? Yeah, I think that's this coming Tuesday. So um, if you're looking to get set up, that would probably be a good time to, to check it out. Um, all, the, all the developers of the project are pseudonymous. So uh, there's a few people that are publicly known, like IOR, you know, Jacob Applebaum, pretty outspoken privacy advocate. Um, but everybody else uh, is just known by their pseudonyms. So uh, it's, uh, there's, there's very few people that are in the know of who these people actually are. Um, and uh, however, their, uh, their signing key is signed by the Debian development team. So if you trust the, the Debian developers, then you know you can then extend that trust to uh, the the Tails development team. Um, so who uses Tails or Tor anonymous computing and why? So. Uh, a lot of the time, journalists and their sources need to be protected. They're revealing some pretty hairy stuff that could potentially land them in hot water, either imprisonment or uh, execution, depending on where this stuff is being released. So it's a it's pretty you know pretty serious business. Um, whistleblowers. Uh, oh, sorry, going back to the the journalists. Um, Reporters Without Borders rely on this heavily to to extra, uh, extract information from hostile networks. Um, and the Freedom of the Press Foundation actually helps to fund uh, uh, Tails development. So uh, it's, it's something that has become a, a, a part of many journalists' daily toolkit. This is their daily driver. So it's something that, that a lot of people do rely on and uh, really helps to, to kind of push democracy forward and, and subvert uh, regimes of that type. So, uh, also whistleblowers, uh, Glenn Gr Greenwald, uh, Edward Snowden, and Laura Poitras use tales exclusively while going through and, and revealing the, the NSA's overreach. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'd say that was pretty effective. So, um, Let's see here, uh, political activists and protesters. Uh, uh, you look at something like the Arab Spring, where um, uh, regimes are trying to, to block social media, and people need a way of, of communicating with each other. Uh, they rely on on Tor browsing to be able to connect to these surface, services that are normally blocked by default. A really interesting application is. Victim, victims of, of stalking in real life or domestic abuse, uh, you know, people that are in abusive marriages uh, or partnerships, what have you, um, have actually started using this. Um, the, uh, the National Network to Dem End Domestic Violence uh, has been teaching people on how to use Tor and Tails to um, distance themselves from uh, people that are that are trying to hurt them physically in real life, tracking them through social media, geolocation, all that sort of stuff, um, and then of course you know people that just care about privacy in general. So, um, so why should you care about privacy? Um, first and foremost is the chilling effects. Uh, just knowing that somebody could be watching you or scrutinizing your actions will actually change your behavior. Um, you're going to be less likely to uh, say or act a certain way if you think that there are going to be negative repercussions for that. Um, so that in and of itself can have a huge psychological effect. Uh, uh, I, 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 a quote that I heard once was, if you can be told what you can see or read, then it follows that you can be told what to say or think. I think that's a really powerful statement um, that, that in order for there to be true, you know, uh, libertizing democracy, it's uh, open communication is really important for that. Um, so any information that is collected by whoever, be it government entities, um, uh, passive tracking, things like that, that information can be edited, mi manipulated, misconstrued to tell whatever story they want it to. Selective editing can, can completely change uh, the, the dialogue and the narrative that, that is put forward. So when, when that information is out there and outside of your control, you're giving away that power, in a sense. Uh, a really good example of that is a uh, uh, talk by a, a professor at the uh, Regent University of Law. 
uh, his name was James Duane, he put on a talk called Don't Talk to Police. And uh, in this talk, he, he breaks it down into two parts. It's, um, the first part is him basically breaking down all the reasons that you should never, ever, ever, un en under any circumstances, talk to a police officer. Because even if you've done nothing wrong, you're completely telling the truth, if they want to find a conviction, they can use anything you say to twist it and land a conviction against you. It's a very good talk. I highly encourage you to check that out. If you just search on uh, YouTube, don't talk to police, it should be you know, one of the very first results. The second half of the talk is actually a, uh, a police officer that I think went on to become a district attorney, um, basically uh, backing him up, saying, yeah, everything that this man has said is true. Uh, uh, anything that you say can and will be used against you. So it's, um, I think that's a, a really good example of um, just not revealing any more information than is needed to. Um, any information that's collected won't be used to your benefit. Don't ever expect to be able to, to file a motion to get your cell phone metadata uh, as, as a, a means of exoneration. In a, in a court case against you. I doubt that's ever going to happen and once again that's kind of the balance of power um, by, by that information being out there it's, it's not something that you can use for your own benefit. It's only going to be used against you. Um, it's also subject to the faults of human behavior. So people are, people are messed up. People do messed up stuff and uh, a really good example of this would be uh, what, what they called Lovent, the, the NSA using um, research against um, love interests, uh, you know, spying on their spouses or uh, collecting nude photos of people and sharing those around the office. Uh, I think that's, it's, um, even if you do think that the intentions behind the program are okay, there's still going to be bad seeds, bad apples, whatever, that uh, are going to cause you problems. So um, I, I'd say better be safe than sorry and not allow them that opportunity to begin with. Um, so privacy is really important, so important that the United Nations uh, declared in Article 12 of the Declaration of Human Rights uh, at privacy is in a, a human right. It says, and I quote, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with their privacy, family, home, or correspondence, nor to attacks upon their honor and reputation. Everyone has the right to the, the protection of the law against such attacks or interference. So I think that's pretty powerful that if, if it's um, considered critical enough to, to be included in a universal declaration of human rights, you know, we, we should care about these subjects. Um, there's also an excellent website, it's, uh, hi I have something to hide, but hide is hi.de, so it's a German domain. Um, and uh, it, it goes through and, and talks about um, all the, the, the arguments for privacy. It, it really tears down the uh, I have nothing to hide argument. Um, and it, it's, it's put together a lot of quotations by people that are much smarter than me, much more eloquent. Uh, people like Glenn Greenwald, uh, Jacob Applebaum, uh, these, these types of, of really prominent pri privacy advocates. Um, so if, if you ever run into somebody that's like, oh, I have, I have nothing to hide, I'm okay with all this, you know, refer them to this website. And it, hopefully, you know, they'll, they'll be willing to, to take that viewpoint into consideration and, you know, maybe realize that they do have something to hide. So, uh, how, how are we doing so far? Is volume level okay? Cool. All right, so to break down what TAILS is, how it operates, um, first, it's an acronym. It stands for the Amnesic Incognito Live System, TAILS, so T-A-I-L-S. Um, so the amnesic portion, the operating system runs entirely in RAM. So it doesn't use, uh, it doesn't write anything to disk, uh, meaning you can, you can use a machine and leave no trace that you ever use that machine. Um, it, this is really useful for subverting forensic analysis. Uh, a good example that I saw from another talk, um, I believe it was by a, 
uh, somebody named Alex Papadopoulos. Uh, he gave a talk at Crypto Festival in 2013. Um, he's a, he's a, a data forensic an, uh, analyst. And uh, an example he gave was uh, when you open, say, like a Microsoft Word document, there are five different uh, uh, forensic artifacts that are left behind by that. So uh, who it was opened by, when it was opened, how it was opened, whether it was double-clicked, open from within Word itself, open by the command line, all this information is left behind when you do any, you know, any basic operation on a computer. All this big data trail is left behind and somebody can come back to, to reconstruct a narrative using that information. So by not writing any of that information to disk to begin with, uh, this, this eliminates the possibility of that information being utilized against you. Um, the, uh, another function is that at shutdown, the operating system will actually wipe the contents of memory. Um, so this is used, <clears throat> excuse me, this is used to protect against what's known as a cold boot attack. Are you guys familiar with a cold boot? Um, yeah, so for those that aren't, a uh, cold boot attack is, uh, this attack was actually researched by Jacob Applebaum and uh, some other people. Um, I can't remember what university it was at. Washington University? Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, the way it works is the, the contents of, of memory uh, is, is uh, it's persistent only for a short amount of time. Once you cut power to your, your RAM, the, eventually that information is, is lost. Uh, what they found was that if you flash freeze your memory chips using like a, a say like a can of compressed air, you flip upside down and just spray it real quick. By flash freezing that memory, you actually preserve the information that's stored on that RAM so they can flash freeze it, pull it, and toss it into a, a forensic memory scraper to dump the contents. What that means is that potentially your, uh, your passwords, your uh, uh, cryptography keys, your private keys, uh, any information that was in RAM can be scraped from that and, and recovered that way. So what Tails does is at shutdown, it will boot a microkernel that its only purpose is to entirely wipe the contents of RAM so that information can't be recovered. Um, however, even though it is amnesic, uh, you do have the option to be able to use persistent storage so that you can save information from one session to another. Uh, we'll cover that a little bit further uh, in, in just a bit. Um, the incognito portion. So, um, one, of the, one of the cool features of Tails is that it does use MAC address spoofing. So, uh, even, even you know, a, a hardware network identifier is, is changed every time on boot. It's randomized, so um, that that can't be correlated to your machine. Uh, this is really useful in things like uh, if you're in a corporate environment where that information is cataloged and assigned to a specific person, uh, that is, is no longer a, a means of, of connecting the dots from your machine to you. Um, all traffic is routed through Tor by default. Uh, when you fire up the machine, you can't do anything network related until a uh, connection to uh, Tor is established. So uh, one thing that it does do is it, it will update the system time. So it'll do NTP requests out uh, to get a, a time synchronized. Uh, the reason it does that is TLS handshakes are dependent on having an accurate system clock. So uh, once uh, once the time has been updated, it will then attempt to connect to Tor, and once a uh, connection is established, it blocks all other traffic uh, by default using IP tables. Uh, you do have the option to use an insecure browser, they call it, um, and that uh, does require it to you know, go through and, and make some configurations to allow uh, that, that insecure traffic out. So that's useful for uh, things like captive gateways. Uh, if, you're, if you're at a, um, like a hotel is a perfect example. Um, or uh, uh, other, you know, uh, coffee shop with public Wi-Fi. Um, so you can fire up the, the insecure browser, you know, uh, 
go through their, their I agree, and then once that's done, shut it down. And when you close that insecure browser, it will revert the changes to the, the uh, IP tables to only allow traffic out of Tor once again. Um, now, a couple caveats. Uh, a network administrator can see that your traffic is going out to Tor. Uh, one way of, of trying to subvert that is using bridges. Um, there's an, an un, unpublished list of um, bridge relays to connect to Tor. Uh, this, is, this is used a lot of the time to uh, subvert like government blocking of, of Tor relays. Um, so you do have that option. But uh, um, even though uh, whoever is monitoring the line can see that you're connecting to Tor, they can't see the contents of that. Uh, so, so you are protected in that sense. Um, also, the destination site that you're going to can see that you're coming from a Tor exit node if you're going to the, the public internet. Uh, if you're only using hidden services, then they can only see that you know, you're, you're just another uh, Tor client. So, um, Yes, you can. Uh, the question was, can you uh, use a VPN exiting Tor to connect to another service, and you can. Uh, there's, there's actually excellent documentation on uh, the Hunix wiki, uh, where they break down um, using uh, a VPN to connect to Tor, and then also using Tor um, to exit to a VPN. And they, they break down kind of the pros and cons of each of those. Um, I would highly recommend you, you check out their, their documentation. It is. Uh, it's Hunix, W-H-O-N-I-X dot org. Um, they have, uh, it's, it's also another uh, privacy focused distribution that takes a bit different approach on uh, anonymizing your traffic. So um, yeah, they have massive amounts of documentation. I, you, you could spend weeks on end digging through it and just learning more and more. So. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent resource. So thank you for the question, that was good. Um, another uh, aspect of the incognito portion is the camouflage function. So when you boot to Tails, uh, you're given the option to use a uh, Windows 8 camouflage mode, where normally uh, uh, Tails uses just a basic GNOME 3 desktop which can be kind of suspicious if you're in a public place. People are like, oh, what's, what's that dude running? You know, what's going on there? Uh, the Windows 8 camouflage gives you, you know, a, a basic layout that looks like a, a Windows 8 computer. So try and, try and blend in with your surroundings. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of a, a cool function. Let's see here. Sorry for the delay be between transitions. It's, uh, running an older version. Um, so it is portable. You can boot to almost any machine, almost anywhere. Uh, you can do SD card, you can do USB drive, you can do a DVD, um, and basically boot anywhere as long as it's um, uh, an x86 compatible system. Uh, it doesn't, they, I don't believe they're working on other architectures. Um, like ARM or, or things like that. So uh, you are somewhat limited in that aspect. But uh, also another caveat is there are certain types of hardware that don't play nice. Uh, for instance, Apple machines. I struggled for the past two weeks to be able to, to get this thing to boot somewhat consistently uh, to, to Tails. So um, they, they have a really good... Uh, Amount of document, <clears throat> excuse me. Amount of documentation up on the website detailing problematic USB drives or uh, hardware that's known not to boot with Tails. But generally, that's more the exception to the rule. Uh, for the most part, you can pretty consistently boot to most hardware. Yeah. Um. The question was, does it work pretty consistently on an x86 Mac? And the answer, in my experience, no. It's, it's, um, it's very fickle. Uh, first, a, a lot of the time what you have to do is you actually have to install an alternate uh, uh, UEFI bloot loader, one called Refind, as the one that I've been using, which was a fork of a project called Refit. 
So that's uh, there. There is some some uh, technical uh, technical overhead in that, and even then, uh, with the same same hardware, there's times where it will work and where it won't work. I've had problems with uh, this very one that I'm using right now freezing before it gets to the desktop environment. So uh, it's it's kind of hit and miss. Uh, thank you for the the question. That was a good one. Uh, and then uh, next up is uh, the live system portion, because what good is a computer if you can't really do anything with it? So by default, Tails tries to be a self-contained one-stop shop for all of your, your general computing needs. So it includes things like uh, your basic web browser. So that, that uses the Tor browser with the NoScript add-on included. Um, by default, NoScript is not enabled. Uh, they chose to use, uh, they chose to, to do it that way because turning off scripts breaks a lot of stuff. And they want this to be very accessible. So uh, you do have the option to just click on the no script icon and block scripts globally. While that is more secure, it can lead to a, a, a much more difficult uh, web browsing experience. So uh, just a, a heads up on that. Um, it does include a mail client. Currently, it is Claws. However, they are looking to shift that to iStove, which is the, the uh, Debian derivative of Thunderbird. Um, the reason being that they're shifting to that is there was actually a security flaw found in Claws, where if you're using an IMAP server, uh, it will actually put unencrypted copies of your, your email on the IMAP server. Um, so that they're they're shifting to Thunderbird to disable you know to to move away from that and also have a project that has uh, a lot more widespread use. That is correct. If you are using Pop3, that is not an issue. So you can use Claws uh, with a Pop3 server and be okay as long as you know you, you make sure that you are encrypting what email you want going out. So uh, GPG is your friend. Um, Next up is a chat client. They include Pigeon. Uh, it comes with OTR by default, so off-the-record messaging. Um, it's, it's really useful for having uh, uh, encrypted communications that have uh, perfect forward secrecy. So uh, the, cha the keys are changing with each message. So if uh, keys were to be compromised, uh, they can't, uh, they can't then use that same key to decrypt any future communications. Um, there's also a Bitcoin wallet, so if you want to um, use a uh, uh, pseudonymous cryptocurrency, that is an option. So that's, that's pretty much ubiquitous throughout uh, um, deep web markets. Um, also includes a password manager, which is really useful for uh, keeping track of identities and the credentials that you have associated with that. It's definitely recommended that you allow, uh, allow that to generate passphrases for you because they're going to be much more secure than almost anything that you come up with yourself. Um, there is documentation software, so LibreAlpha. That's actually what I'm booted to right now. I'm running Tails live uh, on this machine to give this presentation. So um, it is very functional. Um, uh, while while uh, there are some caveats, uh, I'm currently running 3.5 because that's what's included with this. Uh, if need be, you are able to install your own software. So if you want to get a more up-to-date version, you can use apt to uh, go to the repository, get your own copy, and install that on a persistent session. Um, imaging software, it does include GIMP for raster images and Inkscape for vectorized images, um, as well as audio software for uh, handling any you know, calls or if you need to rip audio from CDs or other sources, you can use that. Let's see. Another uh, another neat tool that they oh yeah
That is actually an excellent question. The question was, uh, they recently changed the default search engine from start page, and they were asking, uh, he was asking why they did that. I'm not, I'm not sure, and I'd actually like to look into that. Um, is it DuckDuckGo now? Oh, Disconnect. That's, yeah, Disconnect.me is the default search engine now. That's right. Um, and I'm not sure why that change was made or actually when that was made. I, was that around 1.3? Somewhere thereabouts. Yeah, so. Okay. Okay, uh, so the gentleman was just stating that uh, Tor, uh, the Tor browser, uh, changed to uh, um, to disconnect. Uh, one fu one feature of disconnect is that it does allow you to use different search providers. They will anonymize your searches for different providers. So uh, thank you for that. That's great comp contribution. Um, so yeah, uh, another neat tool that they, they developed, uh, they actually started this for Tails and then moved it upstream to Debian. Um, that's actually a kind of a cool point is that uh, one of their philosophies is anything that they develop for Tails, they do try to push upstream uh, to contribute back to, to mainline Debian. So um, that way there's wider adoption of it, there's more eyes, uh, you're not just developing this very niche, um, uh, narrow, distribution that doesn't have a, a lot of accountability because there's not as many eyes on it. When you when introduce it to a wider code base, then you, you do get that added benefit of the more eyes. Um, many eyes make shallow bugs. Uh, how, so the Metadata Anonymization Toolkit is a, a program that you can feed different files, be it PDFs, uh, different images, audio files, things of that nature, and it will, it will search the file for any potentially uh, revealing metadata, so author, uh, date and time that was created, things of that nature, and uh, yeah. Uh, they are now? Excellent. Excellent, thank you. Um, so yeah, it will look for any information that could be potentially be used to reveal the origin of those documents. I actually passed my own uh, PDF of the, the slides of this presentation as well as uh, handouts detailing how to create your own through this toolkit. And it's, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to use. Uh, you just add the files to it, check them, it'll come back with a state, dirty or clean if it's dirty. Hit scour, it'll scrub that information. You can check it again if you want, and it'll come back clean, ready to hand off. So if you have um, corporate documents that you're looking to leak out, or uh, whatever it is that you're trying to put out there, um, uh, scrubbing location information from photographs, things like that, uh, this will take care of that. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty cool toolkit. I was just informed that uh, those handouts uh, and the slides are, are available on the uh, Crypto Village website. So if you just go to CryptoVillage.org, uh, there's a DEF CON 23 tab. You click on that and those files are available for you to access. Yes, yes, this has been in Tails for quite some time. Um, so if you, uh, if you actually go to the applications, actually, yeah, system tools. It's called MAT. Yeah, M metadata anonymization toolkit. So it's it's kind of hidden, um, but yeah. Um, so that's a, a very useful uh, useful tool. Um, is this this mine? I'm assuming this is mine. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Oh, uh, another cool feature is uh, I2P integration. Uh, I2P is the Invisible Internet Project. Uh, it's another uh, sort of deep web uh, network that is focused uh, more on uh, 
where, where Tor is focused on being able to allow access to the internet abroad, I2P is kind of a self-contained system. So you can't, you can't use I2P to connect to uh, the internet at large. It's, uh, it's also peer-to-peer, -peer, so all traffic handling is done uh, 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 it's, it's a lot more distributed in that sense where if you're connecting, you're also routing traffic for other people. Um, where that, that's different from Tor, where Tor you have to specifically say, I want to be able to relay traffic for other people. So um, it's, it's neat in that everybody that's using I2P is also helping to uh, route traffic that way. For that reason, um, I2P is really useful for peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing. Uh, that's, that's one thing that, that has been used extensively for. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer software is highly discouraged on the Tor network just because the amount of bandwidth that it consumes, uh, is, uh, it, it really strains the resources that are available for Tor at large. Um, to enable I2P, I2P integration, uh, this is done at boot time. So uh, there's a bootloader that will come up. It'll have you know Tails, Tails fa fail safe. Um, I believe you hit Tab to uh, add any additional options at boot time. So you just hit Tab, type in I2P, and enter. And then at that point, the I2P client is enabled, and you're able to uh, visit .eep sites. Uh, Dot I2P, they, uh, EEP sites, okay, sorry, yeah, that was a, uh, um, yeah, misnomer on my part, so dot I2P. Um, let's see here. So, when it comes to anonymous computing, a really important step is threat modeling, defining what it is that you're trying to protect against. Um, I've broken this down into uh, three basic tiers. Uh, your, your first level tier is what I consider to be a passive adversary. Uh, if you're looking for general privacy on the internet, looking to subvert marketing and tracking and things like that, um, this, is, this is kind of your, your lowest level of, of threat. Um, stuff like uh, the super cookies that have been used by various phone providers, AT&T and Verizon, uh, to try and, and track your browsing habits so that they can then turn around and sell that or market it themselves. Uh, also, uh, big profiling companies like Axiom that has incredible amounts of information on almost everybody in the country. Um, uh, this is uh, pretty scary information that you know is basically just going to the highest bidder. So what what those people then do with that information, they have no control over. Um, so it's uh, it's pretty scary in in my opinion. Um, the uh, this is also the um, the tier at which I would say using a virtual machine to run tails is most viable. Um, just because of uh, the, the problems with higher tiers is that it's a lot more targeted and a lot more focused. Um, the problem with a virtual machine is that your host operating system can see what you're doing. Um, and you also have to trust whatever hypervisor you're using to run that. So, um, yeah. Uh, uh, second tier is uh, what I consider a low-level active adversary. So this would be like uh, a network administrator who may be actively not monitoring the network, looking for um, anything going out to, uh, to the internet at large if you're trying to blow the whistle on something um, and, and leak information out that way. Uh, this is, this is uh, kind of the, the next step up from that. Also, uh, things like local law enforcement agencies where uh, the, the technical skill may not be as high as other organizations. Um, this, is, this is the tier where you, you really want to begin to, to kick up your, your own research efforts as far as correlating if, uh, if my um, anonymity were to fail, what consequences would there be for me? And at that point you want to begin to correlate how much time you invest into researching anonymization tools to uh, how much time or how much you stand to lose 
for that anonymity. Um, finally, the, uh, the last here would be your three letter agencies, nation states, um, uh, oppressive regimes, things like that, that are going to be much more sophisticated and uh, have much more access to potentially exploiting zero day uh, uh, weaknesses and um, where, where you're dealing with, with these sorts of organizations, you're looking at bare minimum incarceration uh, or depending on where you are, potentially execution for losing your anonymity. So at that point, you, you really want to step up the amount of research that you're doing. Don't blindly trust what I'm saying, you know. You can, you can trust, but also verify, you know, look into um, doing your own research and learning more about these technologies before acting on them. Um, operational security is is paramount when when dealing with some of these things. So um, I'll be getting into some basic operational security, uh, but I highly recommend you to read the documentation. Um, they, there's many warning pages on the Tails project. Uh, detailing various ways that you can compromise your own anonymity. Uh, there's only so much that the tools you use can do to protect you. Uh, it's, it's like handling a gun. Sure, you can have a safety, you can have multiple steps before that's able to fire, but that ultimately doesn't stop you from shooting yourself in the foot. Um, so I have created some simple instructions on uh, uh, downloading an image verifying that image using GPG to make sure that what you downloaded matches um, uh, what was put out, uh, as well as putting that to a USB drive. Um, if you want, this is a Google Drive link, so um, just a heads up on that. Uh, if you want to get that not through Google, those files are available on the Crypto Village website, as I stated earlier. Um, so. Uh, now for the super simple instructions, uh, obtaining the image for Tails, this is the Tails website. Uh, if you go to tails.baum.org, that's B-O-U-M, Bravo, Oscar, Uniform, Mike, dot org, this is the website you'll see. And uh, uh, so you see that, uh, that green button on the side, it says download tails dot whatever version. Uh, go ahead and mash that there button. Uh, that'll take you to a page to download the image and the GPG signature. You can also get a dot torrent uh, to, to get it from the swarm. Um, the torrent will contain the signature and the ISO image all in one. Um, one caveat is this does require trusting HTTPS. Uh, if, you're, if you're worried about nation states, it has been shown that they can compromise certificate authorities and then use that for manning, middling, whatever connection they want. So if you believe you're under that level of scrutiny, there's a couple things you can do. Um, one, you can try and obtain this image from multiple sources and then comparing the file hashes to make sure that that's consistent. So if you get one from your home connection and then you go to a public library or uh, uh, like a coffee shop and get a couple other instances and compare them and they're different, then that could potentially reveal that you're being targeted. It, that could also be paranoia and one of them could just have been a bad download. Uh, so having multiple copies for verifying that is good practice if you're, you expect to be dealing with that level of adversary. Um, another thing that you can do is getting involved with the web of trust, getting to key signing parties. If you can, if you can verify the chain of trust from whoever it is that, that you're signing their key and, and they have been in some way able to sign the chain back to either the Debian team or to the Tails team themselves, then you have that, that verification that this fingerprint does match what I've obtained. Um, a neat feature of Tails is that once you have a copy up and going, you can yen, then use that for making multiple copies. So once you have a trusted, verified, this is legit version, you can then use that to pump out as many copies as you want. So this is actually from Tails Within itself. Um, it's just under System Tools. Uh, there's a Tails installer. 
I believe there's also a tail sub menu that it's also contained under. And uh, it's, this is about as easy as it gets. Uh, probably one of the easiest ways of mass producing uh, ver uh, copies of tails is to just burn the original to a DVD and uh, fire it up and then use that to make multiple copies. Um, so you can also use this tool to upgrade to a new version of Tails. Uh, it will go through and download uh, the, the differences between the previous version and apply those patches when it goes to, to create a new copy. Um, yeah, so uh, th I've, I've used this, I can't tell you how many times in the past week, uh, two weeks, but yeah, it's, it's great for just pumping out multiple copies. Uh, question. Um, actually, I'm not sure if, uh, does, does persistence get cloned as well, do you, do you guys know? The, the, the question was, uh, can you use this to install your own packages and then copy that to multiple? Yeah, separate partition. Okay. Yeah, so as, as far as the partitioning goes, uh, it, it sounds like no. So I, I am, yeah, wasn't 100% on that. Uh, it sounds like it, it just uses the, um, this tool just clones the uh, OS partition, the system partition. So it's, it's true, and, and that is a, a very good point. Uh, uh, you have to trust the the copy that you're making the the clones from because if you have a compromised copy and you're just pumping out all these all these copies then that's just mass spreading that uh, that malicious version I'm sorry what was that um, yeah so one one uh, uh, the question was, is there anything that you shouldn't add to, a, to an installation? And one thing that you do have to be aware of is a lot of the packages that aren't included by default in Tails don't, under, don't necessarily undergo the same level of scrutiny to make sure that there's nothing that can be done to, to leak anonymity um, or break anonymity, leak identity. Um, so while they are part of the Debian ecosystem, they, they do undergo certain levels of security scrutiny. Uh, they haven't specifically been audited for um, maintaining anonymity and privacy. So that is a, a caveat as you install various software from repositories that you do need to keep in mind. Usually, if you can, uh, it's, it's better not to install a, a tool if you don't need it. Uh, if you can get by with what is included with the base system, that's generally better uh, than, than, you know, just adding everything willy-nilly. Uh, thank you for the question. That's excellent, excellent contributions. Thank you all. Um, now, uh, for persistent storage, uh, that's uh, what, what it, it does is it creates another partition uh, that is encrypted using LUKS, that's uh, uh, Linux Unified Key, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure the, the acronym. Uh, basically, uh, just, um, how much time is that? Okay, 12 minutes. Um, uh, it creates an encrypted partition where you set up a passphrase and every time that you boot the system you can choose whether or not to use that persistent volume and you can also choose whether or not it is read only. Um, so uh, you do want to choose a strong passphrase for your, your persistent volume um, and uh, this, this can be used to store your documents, your GPG keychain, uh, key pass X, key ring, so any, any identity information that you, you, you know, for user accounts and passphrases associated with that, uh, your Bitcoin wallet, any additional packages that you get from apt or other repositories or that you install yourself from, from a package, uh, as well as your configuration files. So this, this, uh, uh, will help you if you're if you're going to reuse a lot of things. This is this is a great way to do it. That's actually what I'm running right now for this presentation. Um,
uh, you, you have to um, provide a, uh, uh, a medium. So it'll, it'll check if the current medium has space for it. Um, I believe you can also, if, if your current medium doesn't have space, you can you know, plug in another flash drive, say I want to use this for persistent storage. Correct, yeah, I've actually, I've, I have like five flash drives, two of which are just, you know, other data drives as I call them. Uh, I don't believe so. The question was, can you have multiple persistent volumes that you can choose between at boot time? And I don't believe you can. I believe it's, uh, you just have that one other persistent volume and you can choose whether or not to use that. I'm not 100% on that though, uh, but I, that does sound right. We can look into it a bit further afterward if you want. Um, yeah, just uh, yeah, let me know and we'll look into that. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so an important part of this is choosing your installation medium. What are you going to be installing to? Um, it does matter. There's, there's certain considerations to, to take into, into account. Are you looking for speed? Are you looking for ease of use? Uh, are you looking for something that's small enough to, to be able to break easily if you need to? Uh, do you need to be able to eat your flash drive in case you know, I don't know, whatever three-letter agency, three agencies after you. You know, these, these are all important considerations to take into account. So um, you really want to base your decision off of your threat model. You know, if, if you're just looking for general uh, private browsing, then, you know, this, this doesn't take as much scrutiny. If you're, if you're expecting an environment where you believe your base system can become compromised, you don't want to have something that is writable. So in that case, uh, something like a DVD would be uh, more well-suited. Um, we'll go through the, the different installation mediums and some of the caveats uh, uh, to their use. We'll look into that now. So uh, one medium is SD cards. This is pretty popular. Uh, a lot of people like using SD cards, and there's, I, I feel there's a, a, a lot of um, a, a false sense of security when using an SD card, because a lot of the time people will see this, this pretty little write protect switch. Well, according to the SD card specification, that isn't hardware write protection it is still up to the operating system to determine whether or not it respects that write protect option. So if you believe your instance can become compromised, they can change the firmware to say ignore write protect switch and then they're just able to write at will. So that is one thing, one thing to take into consideration. Um, uh, pros of the SD card, it, is, uh, it can be writable. Um, so if you want to use it for persistence, you can. Um, and uh, it's, it's also uh, really, really small, really portable. You can, you can break it in half if needed, you know, easily conceal it or destroy it, um, you know, things, uh, things like that nature. So uh, my, my personal favorite that I've had the most experience with is uh, uh, USB drives. And they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, as USB 3 becomes more ubiquitous, it's getting faster and faster, read-write speeds. Uh, this, is, this is probably the fastest method um, for, uh, that, that you have for running tails. Um, significantly, significantly cuts down on boot time and things of that nature. One thing that you have to be aware of is you do have to be able to trust your USB drive. Um, I, in, in researching various USB drives, a lot of them claim to have hardware write protection. Uh, one, one that I thought was really interesting was this company, I don't know if it's pronounced Kangaroo, Kangaroo, uh, something along those lines. They, uh, they advertise this remote management console and I thought uh, that, was, that was kind of a suspicious feature to be kind of clouding. Um, they, they go through some of, the, some of the features of this management console. Uh, one that really stuck out to me was this one. Deliver files to remote Defender USB drives securely over the internet. Why would you want your USB drive to be able to be written to 
by somebody on the internet. That just seems like a terrible idea, especially depending on your threat model. Uh, if you're working against these nation states, then you don't want to be in their pocket. Uh, funny thing about that is they actually advertise that their devices are approved by the US Department of Homeland Security. So, yeah. Um, red flag, anybody? So, yeah, you have to be able to trust the hardware that you're using. Um, one option that you do have for preventing those sort of things is a device called a forensic write blocker. These are used by data forensic an analysts to prevent any write uh, requests to whatever media. So that is one option. Problem is, these devices are expensive. You're looking 100, 120 bucks minimum. Uh, however, if you are lead enough, you can actually write your own forensic write, blo write blocker using uh, bad USB, or no, I'm sorry. Um, uh, using a BeagleBone Black and USB proxy. Um, so th there was a really good talk on this by a guy named uh, Dominic Spill. Uh, he gave this talk at ShmooCon 2014. Um, and uh, the title of the talk is uh, USB Man in the Middle Device. So if you want information on that, you can look it up and make your own write blocker. Uh, Spill, S-P-I-L-L, -L, I believe. I, yeah, I could be mistaken on that. Um, then uh, uh, DVD-ROM, if you're looking for something that can't be written to, that's going to be the same exact thing every time you boot it up, this is a great option. Uh, uh, it's a couple, couple things uh, with DVDs, they are uh, slower. Um, it does have generally good write, uh, read speeds, but not nearly to the extent of, of a USB drive. Um, also the creation of them is slower. Um, so if, if time is critical, then that's something you want to take into account. Um, also, optical, yeah. Yeah, 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 just the initial file copy from, uh, from uh, the disk into RAM to, to get up and running is, uh, can be slower. So if you're very time sensitive, that's, that it could be a factor. Um, also, optical media is being phased out. Uh, a lot of, lot of, you go to a library most days and, you know, they're disappearing. So uh, that's another thing. If you're looking for something that's more portable, this may not be the best option. Um, let's see. So a little bit of operational security here. Um, uh, uh, I'm sure you guys have all heard of the Silk Road. Uh, Ross Ulbricht uh, was running a dark market and... Uh, was, uh, was targeted um, to, to try and bring down uh, the, the, the Silk Road market uh, for drug trafficking. Uh, one thing that they, they were able to do was they were able to look up, um, once, once, they were, uh, the, once they suspected him, they, they looked up his history uh, and, and found questions pertain on a, a PHP forum asking very specific inquiries that paralleled some of the configurations they saw in, in Silk Road. Uh, he had his, his personal email address tied to that account that asked that question. So from that, they were then able to, to you know, set up uh, regular surveillance monitor his actions, where he was going to and from, and actually uh, track him down and arrest him because of that. So uh, a very important operational security consideration is everything has to be new. You know, you can't have any trace that would tie uh, your real world identity to, uh, to this online identity that you're making uh, to, to do whatever is you need to do, whether it's whistleblowing or uh, you know, leaking information to, to uh, journalists, uh, what have you. So you want to have as few correlations with real life as possible. Um, one, one thing that I, I thought was really neat was I had a friend who would just take a random object, drop it on his keyboard, it would spit out garbage. From that garbage you then just try and take and add characters and boom, that's your new username, you know. Uh, that, while there is uh, an element of, of 
you know, human interaction in that. If you do that pattern consistently, that's another pattern that can be, then be traced back to you. But if you're just looking for a burner, you know, randomly generate something, just a random string of characters, especially if you're going to be using a, uh, a password manager where you don't necessarily have to be able to remember that. You're, you're able to, to have this program remember that unidentifiable random string of garbage. Um, GPG and OTR are your friends. Encrypt everything whenever possible. Um, yeah, uh, this is going to be your, your biggest protection um, in any type of communications, is just making sure that you're doing that encryption consistently. Um, what's that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't encrypt with a key that's correlated to something else. Thank you. Yeah, so um, if you can, generate multiple GPG keys. Uh, uh, yeah, don't, don't share GPG keys between different identities. Um, yeah, just uh, as, as much separation between, uh, between each identity as possible. Um, let's see here. Uh, another thing is uh, um, if you really wanted to, you can try and flesh out a fake persona. You know, try and, and uh, throw off the, the scent in that sense, if you will. But keep in mind, it's difficult to keep track of lies. So um, you, you don't want to fall on your own face while trying to throw somebody off your trail. Um, another, let's see here. Uh, yeah, um, another thing that to keep in mind is uh, there's a, a project called Anonymouth that will attempt to um, undermine what, what's called, uh, is it stylometry? Basically, there's, there's ways of, there's a, a field of study that's devoted to uh, trying to identify people based on their writing style. So depending on what words you use, uh, whether or not you use the Oxford comma or not, uh, uh, how grammatically correct you are, these sort of things can reveal that, that can, can uh, Given a, a big enough sample size, uh, somebody can determine that these two identities that are writing these things are the same person. So a couple things that you can try and do to, to subvert that are the, the project called Anonymouth. Uh, it's like anonymous but with a lisp. So just uh, replace the S with a TH. Uh, that was put out by, I, I had the sources here, I, I'm not sure where they went, but uh, that was a university project uh, that's, that's targeted at uh, changing uh, syntactical writing styles to try and subvert uh, that, that stylometry. Another thing that you can do is you can try to use only the 1,000 most common uh, fra or words in the English language. That covers about 80% of, uh, of, of most everyday communication. Uh, by, by using words outside of that, um, that 1,000 uh, thousand most common, that could uh, potentially be a, a point of identification. Like this guy's vocabulary is crazy out there. He's using really weird words. We don't see that too often, sort of thing. So just just trying to um, simplify it, reduce your attack surface that way. Um, next up is snail mail. Uh, if you can. Avoid it at all possible, uh, if at all possible. That's, that's a direct tie to you in real life uh, that can be difficult to subvert. Um, if you absolutely have to use physical mail, uh, if you're receiving something, try to use an abandoned address, uh, something that, that doesn't have a direct tie to you. Um, if, if you're looking to pick something up, uh, don't jump to it immediately once it ships. It's, if it's something that, that is going to be monitored, it depends on how much they're willing to devote, devote in resources to monitoring that. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very distinct possibility that that may be lost. So um, if, it's, um, if it's something that, that you believe would be seized and used in a, in a case against you, then uh, um, that raises some interesting questions because eventually will they just capture it themselves and prevent you from having it or will they continue to sit on it hoping to catch you? I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. Um, another option that I've heard about is using a burner mailbox. So go to, going to get like a P.O. box or like a, a, a UPS store box 
and having something shipped to that. One example that I heard for trying to add another layer is uh, getting a, a fake identity uh, or a fake ID, uh, some type of documentation that you can use to then create uh, another burner mailbox using that fake identity so that you have a step of, of extrapolation away from your actual identity. Um, if you can, test the pickup process beforehand uh, so that you're not just walking in blindly. Um, uh, you would want to use that for something completely uh, um, uh, off the radar, something, you know, random. Get, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what a, a really good example would be, um, but that, that is also another consideration if you think there's going to be uh, uh, video surveillance in place that, that could be used to correlate that. Um, maybe that's not something you want to do. It's, uh, this is something that I haven't researched a whole lot, uh, so I definitely do encourage you to do more in-depth research if this is something that you would need to rely on. Um, so uh, a couple things to combat de-anonymization attacks. Um, there, there's, uh, there's one um, uh, attack that was, that was uh, published by Columbia University. Uh, it uses NetFlow for traffic correlation, uh, and it, that attack, that specific attack, works best if there's 100 plus megabytes of uh, traffic to, to attempt to analyze between to correlate between the entry and the exit. So if you can keep your your overall traffic under 100 megabytes per session, um, that well that this is for uh, general tour sessions where you're going out to the internet at large, not necessarily to things like I2P, uh, where that's all, all contained. So um, that, that is one thing to, to keep in mind. They used to um, also encourage you to uh, generate a, uh, a new identity when trying to um, uh, switch activities. Uh, there used to be a button that you could click on to say, you know, uh, new circuit, which would uh, attempt to use a new entry node and, uh, uh, you know, new three hops in, in your Tor uh, relaying. Uh, they actually now encourage you to just reboot the system. The reason for that being is that uh, sockets can persist between circuits. So if a, a previous socket had been opened on your old identity, that may still be open uh, when you generate the new circuit. So uh, you could potentially be sending traffic over two different, uh, two different circuits. Um, so rather than, than relying on that new identity, go through a full reboot. Make sure that nothing is still open. Uh, that way you can have the assurance that you are on a fresh identity. So if you have multiple identities that you're trying to keep separate, you know, do whatever activity on identity A, reboot, do whatever activity on identity B. Uh, yeah, there, so there is still the option to change identity. I think they were looking at changing it to new circuit. Is it, is it change identity or is it, what's that? It's, it, okay, so it is new identity. That's a bit of a misnomer and, and kind of a, um, a red flag. I, I was reading through uh, some of their, their um, issues on, on the bug tracker on Rise Up, and they're actually looking at removing that entirely. Um, so that is um, just because of the, the potential risk, uh, they, they would rather remove that than, than have the, the false assurance that, oh, everything I'm doing is, you know, new identity, can't be traced. So, um, yeah, but uh, thank you for, for pointing that out. I, I do believe that is being removed in the future. I'm not sure at what point, though. Um, that's, uh, that's everything that I have. Um, so uh, basically, how, how can you help with this? Even if you're not actively using it, this may be something that you, you think is an awesome tool for the world to have. Um, I, I, you know, I, outside of using it for general browsing or doing these presentations to teach other people about it, it's not something that I rely on too heavily, but I still uh, try, to, try to encourage its use and, and proliferation. So. Um, it is an open source project. All the usual means of contribution are still available, whether it's code, documentation, um, internationalization, if you can translate, uh, any, anything of, uh, you know, just promoting, you know, giving a presentation yourself. Please feel free to steal all my information and disperse it. Like, that would make me happy. Um, 
Yes, all my personally identifiable information. No. Um, and then, obviously, the, the easiest way is to donate. You know, shut up and take my money kind of thing. Uh, so the, the three biggest uh, projects that are involved in Tor are going to be, are, I'm sorry, Tails, are the Tails project itself. You can direct, uh, directly donate on their website. Um, you can also donate to the Tor project, and they, they also help to fund Tails development. So kind of a trickle-down effect that way. Also, the Freedom of Press Foundation helps to uh, fund Tails development. So um, these are, these are uh, uh, all excellent projects that I, I highly encourage you to get involved with and uh, you know, help, uh, help advance the, the future of democ democratic speech on the internet. Um, any, any questions? Yes, that's an excellent point. Uh, Tor, is, I, is Tails also a nonprofit? Okay. Yeah, so uh, Tor is a, a 501c3. It's C3, yeah. Uh, so it is nonprofit. You can do tax deductions if you live in the US, so that's awesome. Encourage your employer if, if uh, they're looking for a tax break to you know, maybe look to that. Um, and I believe Freedom of the Press Foundation is also a nonprofit. I'm not 100% what the status of Tails is. I think it might be, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't recall specifically reading up on that. So, um, but yeah, uh, questions, comments, clarifications? Yeah. That's an excellent question. The question was. Are there, have there been any copyright issues with uh, the Windows camouflage mode? I haven't heard of any, um, and I think it would be a pretty scummy thing for Microsoft to do. Well, uh, it, it's, yeah, um, yeah, that, that's not really much of, a, of an assurance against that, but uh, it, it would suck if they did choose to pursue that, and I would hope that somebody in Redmond would be like, look, you know, this is, yeah, this is, this is uh, taking it a bit far. Um, I, I haven't heard of any, any problems coming from that. I guess it potentially is a possibility, but I, I haven't heard of anything of that, so, uh, of that sort yet. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, have I tried other, uh, other distros that look to do kind of the same thing as Tails? Um, I have not. The, the two that I'm most interested in looking into further are uh, Hoonix, W-H-O-N-I-X. Uh, the way that Hoonix works is it actually operates as two separate machines. It's known as what it's, uh, uh, what's known as a Torifying gateway. So you have one machine that its entire purpose is for um, connecting to Tor and opening up an interface that another machine can then connect to so that uh, the, the second machine is where you actually do all of your, your daily driver activity. Um, the, the reason for that being is it's to try and, and prevent any IP leaks from whatever services are, are, you're running in that second machine. Uh, the uh, hunix.org is an excellent resource for uh, documentation on that. They have a breakdown on what, uh, what it protects against using that type of model um, and also compares it against Tails, the Tor browser bundle, uh, and a couple other projects. One called Corridor that I'm barely even remotely familiar with, and another one uh, called Cubes OS, Q-U-B-E-S. Um, that one, uh, the concept behind Cubes OS is that it runs every application within its own uh, virtual instance. So um, it's, it's basically every application that you run has its, its own virtual machine, essentially. Um, I, I haven't done a whole lot of research into those two projects. I think those would be uh, definitely worth looking into further. Um, and once again, that also ties into you know, uh, correlating how much research you're doing uh, in, 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 an, uh, in accordance with your threat model. So um, yeah, uh, the more you can learn, the, the, the better, the more protected you're going to be. And uh, yeah. I, I think that's always a good thing. Yeah.
That's, that's a very good point. Um, the, so when it comes to email, uh, there is metadata that can be uh, pulled from that. They can see that this person re received an email from whoever. You can use burner email addresses. There's many uh, email providers like Hushmail or ProtonMail. Um, and this is something that I, I was hoping to have more time to research before giving this presentation so that I could uh, give a little bit better recommendation uh, as far as who to use or, or what resource. Um, uh, one thing that I think is really interesting is uh, Dime, uh, dark, uh, dark Mail. Um, uh, there, that's a that's a project that's currently in, in development that they're hoping to use as a uh, uh, a replacement for uh, GPG encrypted email that's designed to not uh, leak any sort of metadata. Uh, while that's still in development, it's not uh, not very. Uh, widely used or accessible. So uh, for the time being, I don't really have a, a good answer for uh, what a good provider for anonymous email would be. Uh, you had a, a question, sir? Mailinator? Okay, so a recommendation was yeah, a recommendation was for Mailinator. Uh, I'm not familiar with the service. Definitely, you know, research it. You know, uh, uh, do verify. You know, trust and verify. Always do the verification. Um, uh, I believe a, a, another um, uh, another communication means was uh, like Mi Mixmaster or Mixminion, which uh, is is not instantaneous. If you send a message using either of those, it does take a long time before that pop propagates out. And I'm not sure if those projects are active anymore. Um, those, those are two things that may be worth researching. Um, so yeah, Mixmaster, Mixminion, and Mailinator. I'd definitely say, you know, do some research on those and, and see if those are uh, um, good options for, for your needs. Thank you.